in TV land, if anybody's out there, what we're doing now is the first half of these programs, whether you're getting or not the full hour, we're taping an hour every time we do this, and the first part, more or less, is made up of people reading these sort of one-liners and little bitty stories called, most of them say, and Kairut said, and this little story, Kairut's supposed to be see somebody else that writes this stuff. And so what we're doing now is here in the, <clears throat> I'm not going to say studio, here in this joint where we're filming this, the people, I'm not going to say studio audience, the people here, and I assume they are decent people, I don't see a Georgia Tech student in the crowd. <laughs> They are sending up, we have a screen that flashes the number of each page being read, and people are sending up a request for page so-and-so that they would like to hear an additional comment on, they think. <laughs> and so then they're putting them up here, and then I'm walking up, and I'm getting them, and then we're going to look at them, and I'm going to pull it back out and read what it was and make some additional comment, if any is available in this reality. <laughs> that, that's where this stands and if this begins to kind of get if, if it doesn't work what we're going to do is draw some numbers and have a lottery <laughs> well you, you could well I don't know what prize we actually had but it was one of them I know was, was two free years somewhere it was a coupon it was two free years of accordion repairs <laughs> up, it's a place up in Roswell but all right, so here's what we're going. We're trying to get to it. We still got, see, a bunch of them from last time when we first started. Thanks to the slowness of these old cameras, it ran so slow I couldn't catch up and them all last time. So we put in a new light bulb up here, that red light, so I think it's going to work faster. Uh, so, all right, now we're going to pick back up right quick, try to pick them up from last week. This is going to go fast, maybe. Uh, some of them I think I can just remember other than read them all, or maybe not. Uh, one of them, I'm not even going to look, I think I lost the, but one of them was the, an, an old man told a kid, said, if you want to see a civilization collapse, is let authors begin to review their own books. And uh, the reason I wanted to start with that is it's another extremely good example for you people out there in TV land, or looked at another way, if you watch this periodically, and you find it to be egregiously irritating. So it's whether you like it or whether you just despise it, here's another great example to reinforce your what? Hernia? No, opinion. Hernia. Because when you first hear, somebody said, all right, if you want to see civilization, a civilization collapse has let authors begin to review their own work. Now, at first you could take a view. If you took that as being some sort of just joke, you'd go, well, that is ridiculous because then, of course, the authors are just going to praise themselves and, you know, it's just ridiculous. You can't call it civilization. You can't call it, I don't know what they'd make of it, just probably a cheap, Real short live joke. But if I may speak for Senior Kairut again, none of these are simply jokes, at least in his opinion. That's why I like saying I'm Kyr that he wrote those <clears throat> because I can say that he said that. Say the none of them are just jokes. Because the thing about as much as even Kairut has tried to make some little roundabout straying off the Oregon Trail somewhere down around Fort Lauderdale before you get there, and taking shots at what seemed to be, or seemed to be taking shots at criticism, civilization would collapse if, to take that one example, which was an easy one, if you allowed authors to review their own books. But don't stop it just saying, well, that is, it's silly, it's just a, that's just a small joke. I'm not even going to laugh at it. It's not worthy of that because it's just ridiculous. You could not call a review we're using review and criticism in the same sense now, academic, literary criticism. Because your ordinary mind would just say, well, you can't even call it a review. You can't say that, all right, Mr. X is going to review this book if it turns out he wrote it because whatever he says is going to be invalid. Well, that's not funny. I don't even know why you brought it up. Consider. The whole setup was that the man told the kid, the old man, that if you wanted to see a civilization itself collapse, because what is involved here is much more than authors and books. For the secondary world to survive what you've got to have, is no matter how foolish it may appear, no matter how meaningless it may appear, no matter how pretentious it may appear to you or to anybody, you have got to have for the civilized world, the secondary world, for it to breathe and for it to grow, it has got to have opposition. 
and it can appear to be, and it will to some people, appear to be absolutely preposterous because the setup for the Kairut, uh, there are many people on this planet that would take the whole idea, not just of literary criticism, but the whole literary world as being preposterous. There are people that would say, well, books to begin with are a waste of time. So to talk about people making a living reviewing books, we're talking about a double waste of time. And it's not so. Because the very world that that kind of person could be laughing at, that world would no longer exist if you did not have the continuing opposition, if you did not have a dance of somebody criticizing. And you can take that all the way from a very cheap way, such as a guy who's driving a Ford laughing at a guy down on Alabama Highway that is so dumb he's driving a General Motors car. You can do it from that to some guy with three or four degrees engaged in whatever the hell literary criti or critical decomposition is nowadays, and making these very arcane, whatever the hell that means, critiques, whatever that means, of this other man's writing, whatever it meant. <laughs> it does not matter once you understand that the air must be here for all to breathe, that if you started trying to cut out some people, that you didn't like the cut of their jib, you didn't like where they live, the kind of car they drove, they're too big, they're too little, they breathe too much. If you took away those people, eventually you're not going to be able to breathe. Now I'll leave it to you, most of you I'm sure took at least elementary biology or the natural sciences in the sixth grade to know why. You can't do away with them. Now I go to the secondary world. They would not be civilized, there would be no civilized ordinary world in which to live unless there was that which even can seem to be preposterous. You, know, you, know, you and your friends could have a couple of beers and be educated and all insist, well, that is preposterous. It's somebody over here. You could be laughing at people up there circa 19, or well, the whole decade, the 90s, and people on one side of the street you know, shouting out about abortion and somebody on the other side shouting out about these people. You could take the position of your own to hell with it. Who cares? Or you could take the position of who cares if uh, another country takes away our heavy steel industry because I don't eat heavy steel anyway, so what do I care? <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to see it can be from your position, at the, an ordinary mind, that you could take your best view of it and say, well, this, this whole controversy, which is a form of criticism, this whole question let us say that you're educated enough that you knew words like moot and actually knew what it meant. You could say the question is moot. If you're more a regular down-home person or a roofer, you might say, you know, they're nuts. Same thing. You have got to have that kind of opposition. There's a great example going on. You just want, uh, it even touches the arts. If you want to talk about from one view, you could... I shouldn't do this, but I assume some of you heard about it right quick. A well-known artiste, a painter, who died. Uh, left some sketches in the hands of his psychiatrist, and his psychiatrist has now decided to publish them, or already has, and now the late great artist, they wanted me to say great, his spouse, his surviving spouse, has now brought suit in our fine judicial system to stop the psychiatrist from using these sketches that her husband, who was in treatment with him, for his profit. I told you I shouldn't have stopped. But from one view, because I was trying to drag in something that has a degree of artistic wherewithal, perhaps a little more than doing gutter and roofer work, brings in psychiatry, brings in questions of legality, brings in questions of morality, she, in fact, according to suit, is even if you know, one shot don't work, you people don't know about suits, uh, once you get it going, you can sue on several bases. Like, well, if one of these don't work, may the court please consider this other one. And one of them is that he is raking, violating the client, oh, patient. I'm so, I always confuse customers and <laughs> patients. Well, I guess one reason I had such poor success when I tried to go into analysis once I don't. I, I was thinking of something like you know having your front end real lined like. <laughs> at any rate, part of the suit is that he, the psychiatrist, is violating the doctor-patient relationship because 
I'm saying his wife, of course, her attorney, is claiming that these sketches that he left, which the psychiatrist now is assuming, and a publisher somewhere is assuming is going to be worth you know, a few shekels somewhere in profit, she is saying it was, some, it was part of his treatment, a part and parcel, that the psychiatrist would have never had his grubby hands on these sketches had it not been for their relationship, etc. All right, did I do enough? It has elements that if I did not start out making it sound as though it might be some sort of, you know, Kyrudian non-aligned observation of this, you could say, well, this has very interesting civilized, cultural, as they say in Alabama, high class, a certain kind of patina to it. It's not just guys out, it's not just guys out arm wrestling over who's going to buy the next beer. We have a psychiatrist. We have a suit in our courts. We have a very famous artist, recently decreased. <laughs> well, he was real tall, and I think they had to fold him up to get him in a box. We have all of these elements, questions of morality, the doctor-patient, all of this. And so from one view, you could start and say, well, now this is very interesting, but you could suddenly take another view and say, Jesus, holy Christ. The artist, by the way, was a very well-known uh, abstract expressionist. That he was <laughs> well, he was famous because many people who are civilized, you'll even if you didn't know his name, he he specialized in pouring out paint on canvas, and people paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. So all you got to do is just be ordinary. You can still be civilized and think, Phew, another one of those. Talk about the idiots of the world. People pay museums pay a million dollars for this, and the guy. I mean, it was no secret. He threw out paint, laid the canvas on the floor, <laughs> and he kept throwing it until he found one he liked, and he hung it up, and people... And so you go, boy, how stupid. And now his wife is suing a psychiatrist over sketches, not even the real thing. Jesus. Tut, tut. Did I waste my time? You don't have to like art. I'm not defending art. It doesn't need defending. I'm not attacking art. I'm not attacking the legal system. But do you understand that the world as we know it, unless you want to be stripped down, jacked up in somebody's front yard in Alabama, <laughs> and you be a rusted out 49 Ford, if we're going to talk about you being civilized, what do you call civilized? Let's say that you're civilized in a way that you do not need modern art. What you want is a nice place to sit down, have a cold beer, some Travis Crent, Hank Williams Jr. on the jukebox, and maybe some prints on the wall of Norman Rockwell paintings. All right, that is culture to you. It's either that or you're going to be laying in a ditch, wrestling with the hogs and the pigs. So everyone who even hears this, who could hear this and even object to it, you're civilized enough that whether you like art or not, you do like civilization. You do support the secondary world if you think. You could not have that same kind of world. You could not have a jukebox that works. You could not have cold beer in the local bar. You could not have cheap reproductions of Norman Rockwell Saturday, uh, the covers of the old Saturday, whatever the magazine was, covers, were it not for the very things, not just that one specific, but the very thing as foolish, as pretentious, as preposterous, as time consuming, wasting taxpayers' money, as. The artist who died who threw paint down on the canvas and called it art. His wife, now suing a psychiatrist, which you can say, well, psychiatrist to begin with was a bunch of bunk. What the hell is he doing in analysis? Or you can say, well, that just proves that all artists are nuts anyway. <laughs> so you can get all entangled that and say this is a great example of the futility of certain aspects of civilization. You cannot partially kill somebody and the rest of them live. I mean, to pick out somebody that lives down the street from you and say, well... He is my brother-in-law, but there are certain parts of him I can't stand. Well, if you kill part of him, now, come on. Even you people who went as far as the sixth grade. Now, I know that some of us did. You, can, you know that if you kill part of a guy, I don't mean just cut off a finger. That, you can pass that off as a mark of distinction, remember. <laughs> but if you partially kill him, partially kill him. Now, you've got to do something. All right, take out his liver. Let's say that. That you say, well, you are my sister's husband. So I'm not going to actually kill you as I see it. Well, assuming that you're not an actual graduate in the healing arts. You're not a doctor, so you're not an expert. But you know 
you've got a good guess that a bullet in the brain would kill somebody completely. Not. So you think, well, I'll just hold you down. I'm going to do something to teach you a lesson. I mean, you've borrowed money from me and you never pay me back. Plus, you play all that damn opera music and stuff at night and drive me nuts. And so you decide, I'll kill you partially just to help teach you a lesson. And so you kill him partially by taking out his liver. Now, I assume all of you know that uh, there is no recorded cases of a man living sans a liver. So you cannot partially kill somebody. You cannot decide. Oh, sure, you can want to, which is part of the whole process. It's part of the bigger fool theory that runs it. So wait a minute, there are people dumber than I am. Of course, that gets to be another one that I don't want anybody to ask for additional commentary. But you can say there are certain aspects of civilization. There are certain aspects of, as we've been calling here, the secondary world. The world as I know it. I don't like all the worlds I know it. Nobody on this planet does. But there are parts of this world that we simply do not need. It's not that I just don't like it. It's a hindrance. Let's leave it that you don't like it. Okay, right, let's leave it. There. If you cut it out, something as preposterous as this woman suing a psychiatrist over printing, publishing sketches of this artist who was a fraud, who was a nut, who was in analysis, he's dead. Who the hell cares about his paintings? Much I don't even want to see his sketches. I've seen pictures of his paintings. They're about enough. And he gave a guy sketches, and she's going to sue and tie up our courts. Give me a break. You cannot partially kill anything alive. You cannot partially kill the secondary world. Jesus. <laughs> well, we hadn't even started. That was from last time. And I got all these from last time. All right. Does talking loud help? Well, hell, how should I know? <laughs> Where are we? All right. God, here we go. Number 15, and Kairut said, In that growth is universal, problems local. To see human problems require that you stare at immediate local conditions and keep your eyes to the very ground of your relative planet, of your native planet. Growth is universal, problems local. Now, we've been through some of this. And there's no way, certainly, that you can prove it to an ordinary person, nor would I try. But it's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about, or just got through talking about. Growth is universal. If you see a problem, it's local. Because it, to begin with, if you see it, it's from a local view anyway. It's you saying, wait a minute, you just heard that a tax-supported museum in your city just paid $2 million for An abstract painting. And you think, I paid for part of that goddamn monstrosity. Something's got to be done about that. You know, that's a problem, but it's your problem. No, it's everybody's problem. No, no, no. <laughs> if you can see it as a problem, it's local. I don't mean, I'm not saying whether it's valid, invalid. It requires no attempted or lack of judgment. That is, of us judging that the guy's complaint is invalid and without basis. No. If he says it's valid, it's valid. But it's local. And the proof is right before your eyes, although you can't prove it. And that is, is life continuing on? Yeah, but, see, but is the intro to a local problem. Or to say, uh, is it your opinion? Have you read enough, or would you believe history, assuming it's not a communist fraud? Who are we going to pick on now the communists are gone? <laughs> I heard the best one that the only place that the Communist Party is still healthy is the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, at any rate, some kind of conspiracy. Bricklayers, roofers, attorneys. Maybe that's the next one. <laughs> if you can see a problem, we're not questioning what anybody says, but if they say that's a problem, it is local. Because if you ask the person, well, is it just your general impression that life is getting better? And we don't have time to drag this out through a little piece of, or long piece of dramatics, but you understand we've been through this. Somebody might say, no, life's going downhill. But if you say, look, you're 50 years old. You're a little educated. You do know that your generation is living more, longer, you're taller, healthier, and stronger than your father. Well, that's true. 20 years better than your grandfather. Well, that's true. Uh, look how, just your, if you're old enough, you remember your grandfather, some of you, they were out in the country, they had outhouses. They didn't have indoor plumbing. 
they had their they're constantly swatting flies. So it's still going on, of course, on this planet. You can say, come on, quit hollering about local conditions right now, your neighborhood conditions. It's not safe to go into a 7-Eleven store. They're going to shortchange you. Don't you see that regardless of the fact, just hold your brain for a second, don't you understand, won't you admit from one view that life, you know, forget spiritually and all that crap, because that's the kind of people they always are. Don't you realize life is getting healthier, it's easier to live, air conditioning is more plentiful, it's cheaper to get on your automobile, and you have to go, well, all right. That's it. And that's still doesn't prove anything, it's just you either got to feel. And everybody will do this if I said, don't you see, can't you feel that life is getting better, that life is expanding? You know, pick out some center now and get out your little thesaurus and go, what in the hell is a thesaurus? And that life is getting better, more complex, fuller, more alternatives, greater variety, healthier. And you, if you're sane for a second, anybody on this planet, any sane person is going to go, yeah, except with very few exceptions and if they happen they're probably part of this people go well yeah but that is the beginning of the admission of a local problem because even if people educated people would say all right yeah you're right life is in general getting better but look at what we're doing to the planet which is circa 1992 still one of the hot topics we're destroying the planet. So you understand, they can have it every way they want it. Not that they're wrong, that's the way it's supposed to be, but you say, perhaps I get them to agree just for a second. All right, life is, they won't bite their tongue, but if I, you know, slipped them a dollar offered to buy the next round, people hate to say life's getting better. Remember that guy did not in the car route. You know, he said, the more he watches, makes him begin to feel better about being alive, and it scares the heck out of him. He could have said that it P.O.'s the <laughs> heck out of me. At any rate, let's say that I offered to buy the next round, and you can get ordinary people, and you say, all right, look, we can't play with words forever. we only got a minute or so left. Can't you feel that life is getting better? And they go, well, yeah. Now, let's not just make fun of them because then they can come up with a valid argument. They're everywhere. They can say, well, yeah. And then you know these statistics as well as I do. They can say, but you realize that in the rainforest, our Brazil, which constitutes what it is, 30% of the oxygen production machinery on this planet, that every second or every minute we're destroying 200 acres that will take decades to replace. And if you listen to that, you think, Jesus, I was feeling pretty good. But, you know, that is enough to, you know, kind of make you mad and think, well, God damn, won't they stop it? <laughs> Problems are local. But you understand, as long as your mentality, as long as you think locally, you have it every way you want it. That every now and then, you could say, well, I think too bad. You don't need me, because that wouldn't accomplish much to always be around and say, come on, admit it. I'll buy the next round. I'll tickle you. Admit, life, you know, cheer up for a second. Don't be the old sorehead. Life is getting better. Admit it. I mean, you eat better. You got better, all right, you got better television shows than your father had. You got more channels. And people go, well, uh, cars are better. They last longer. Even if you got to buy a German or Japanese, at least they, they last longer. Well, tires. <laughs> you can get 50 or 60,000 miles, 1940. I mean, you had to take two or three spares with you. You could roll over a pebble. You could roll over a penny and get a blowout. Well, admit it, life is getting better. And they go, well, all right, but. And then the but is not just a joke, such as burning down the rainforest. Or, you know, we're filling up land dumps. And suddenly you saw it too, or they hold up a photograph. Garbage. These trains, these barges coming out of Queens and Staten Island. Where can we go? It's like instead of the you know, ancient mariner or the flying Dutchman that sees barges of garbage searching you, you know, let me in. And the guy says, well, life's getting better, but we're destroying the world. Forget Brazil. My backyard is full of garbage. And you look down, there's all these coffee grounds and all these yucky McDonald containers. And they go, look at that. All right. Validly, right then, if you look and you get the same love set, you go, well, you're right, you know, who the hell wants that? <laughs> it's local, though. 
But notice, at the ordinary level, you can have it every way. Even if an ordinary person normally plays out a sore head kind of attitude, that is, that they would not normally be saying, God damn, life is great. But they are offering that basis, witness the fact that suicides are held to a tolerable degree. So even though people do not go around talking about it, they do find that life is opposed to the alternative, that life you know, is all right. And unless you try to get them to consider that life is not just all right, you know, I paid for one round, I got you to admit life's getting better. All right. Well, now forget that, I paid for the round, I'm not going to buy any more, just wise up and realize whether you like it or not. Whether your hormones want to drag their little feet, whether they want to hold on, they're at the edge, and you keep saying, let go and drop, and they hold on like they're supposed to, primarily, but the secondary level, they keep holding on. The train's pulled out, and they're holding on you know, to the edge of the station. Yeah. No, no! Known as life and change. <laughs> Even though the ordinary mind does not constantly think about, well, life is getting better, it does offer on the base that it is tolerable as opposed to the alternative. And yet, if you've tried to point it out, that, hey, cheer up. Quit being a Baptist. <laughs> quit, quit being political. Forget being a Republican. Forget whether you're an Indian or a Japanese or whatever. Forget that. Life is growing. If you've got a good friend on the primary level, you've got a sexual partner. But life gives you the opportunity to have a real good friend. And then people, that is, cheer up, life is good, not to tell anybody. We're not going to start an optimist parade here. <laughs> but I'm telling you, don't you see it? You realize that life's getting good, and the people normally will begin to adversely react to oppose it, which makes things interesting. And every piece of opposition they come up with is valid, because it is locally true. I'm not going to question, it doesn't matter, that we are burning down every minute 200 acres of down near irreplaceable rainforest in Brazil, which we cannot do without. And at the rate we're going, now it's got statistics. The Romans and Greeks have, but they, they get, at the rate we're going, Brazil will be, it'll look like South Alabama. <laughs> The, the rainforest will be gone and we'll all be choking to death. We will not be able to produce enough oxygen on this planet. At the rate we're going, I can prove it. i got my calculator. Burning down 270 acres of rainforest every minute. 17 years, we're going to be done for. Of course, does anybody remember? You're old enough to remember the people shortly after the war was the population bomb. At the rate we're going, there'll be so many people on this planet not only will there not be enough room to park, we'll be, we'll be eating up all the food. And they could prove it. They literally could prove it. There was a big hit, maybe a big seller. Maybe it's a little before you guys' time, but in the 50s, the population bond. There were whole schools, chairs being set up in some of the major universities studying this problem. Because it was mathematics. It was no, no big problem just showing how things, once they got... Good census figures, and the world's becoming more civilized after WW2. They could punch in the figures on their calculator and show at the rate it was going. And it was long before now. It was like by 1979, we were all going to be standing shoulder to shoulder. I mean, taking up Montana, Alaska, the whole island of Tasmania, and further south, which I know nobody asked for that one, to prove. We be, we're going to kill ourselves. That's, that's the danger, I started to say, I'm being superficial, the danger of being a Cassandra. But there is no real danger because you always die before your predictions come around. Of course, you, you might be turned into a god or a prophet. It's not worth much profit, though, once you're gone. We're out again. The point was where we, I'll try to leave you, is that there is no escape once you see it. It can't be proven or disproven. But it's just remember, any time that you identify a problem, it's not whether it's true or not. It's not to say, well, they're making it up. Just like they made up those movies and out in Hollywood they're showing men walking on the moon. They weren't actually there. The same way you can say, well, they're making up this thing about these garbage dumps and all these landfills that's beginning to eat up. Staten Island, the way it's going, there's not going to be a Staten Island. It's going to be Staten Dump by <laughs> da, 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 19 whatever. It's not that that's not true, but if you identify it and it strikes passion within your hormonal 
and enzymal systems <laughs> that is it gets to your secondary, not your primary, because your primary was the fist. But it rained tonight, that's the fist. Because nowadays you don't normally need your fist. No, I don't need my fist. I'm civilized. I'll make a brain fist. That is, I'll criticize. I will worry. I'll wring my hands mentally. Oh, the landfills. <laughs> oh, the rainforest. If you can identify it, no matter if it's valid, it's local. And if it's local, it's temporary. And if it's local, it's with no consequence. The obvious one being, I hate to be metaphorical. Well, why stop now? <laughs> Look how healthy you are. <laughs> we'll assume. You do know that there's cells right this second in you. I don't want to scare anybody. They're dying. There went one. Gone. I didn't notice it. Yeah, but people say, oh, we're going to destroy this planet. You do know that they're bacteria living all over you, don't you? <laughs> Not just your cells dying. There are, according to reports, I've never got down and tried to get a calculation, but there are millions, in fact, billions is the term, the figure, of bacteria, live entities that live on everybody. They're living on you. Every time you, you know, do this, you scratch your head, you've killed a bunch of them. Do you understand? And they could be saying to themselves, like some of these little bacteria, maybe maybe some of them are smoking. And some of them are saying, or maybe some of them are throwing away, you know, egg cartons and plastic, plastic. And some of them are telling the other ones, you're going to destroy our planet. That is you. And you go, and there went 40 billion of them. I'm not trying to make you feel insignificant. But for people to go, oh, we're going to destroy this planet. I, I do not encourage wagering. But if you ever want to see a sure bet on the hoof, not even close to a glue factory, there it is. Oh, we're going to destroy this planet. Can you imagine the more this planet hears that, that even the planet begins to think, <laughs> Begin to get stressful. The planet, the planet began to worry. As I, as I said, I didn't really mean to get into this, but other than just small things like just periodically, there's even a better one, a little twist. Not making fun of them because it's a nice hobby, but you know, Mount Etna is uh, doing again over in Italy, and now they're over there and they're reporting on the news, even. Foreign countries, America even contributed, flew over planes, and they're throwing in large, large concrete boulders, I think they called them, throwing them into the crater to try and in some way kind of control it. <laughs> I guess the news source is trying to be nice, especially since our native country is not, was involved. They report it in such ways as there seems to be a limited amount of success this <laughs> far. We're either going to destroy this planet or we'll begin to take care of... What is that, Hubert? Is that a, is that a hurricane coming up there? Right? Is that... Look there, just right off St. Thomas. Is that a hurricane? Hey, go get one of our planes. Go get some... You understand? It's just the other side of the coin of, hey, we're going to destroy the planet. I didn't really want to get crude in it, but, you know, the other side of this is, hey, this plant's going to destroy us. And I'll leave it to you as to where you would like to place your bet. <laughs> would you like to be ordinary and waste your money? It's just a hobby because people go to the track and lose day after day. And you say, well, why in the world do you do it? I could make a joke out of it, but it's not really just a joke. There are people that go out and gamble all the time. They look at it as, well, that's just the cover charge. Yeah, I lose all the time, but it's fun to be here and all the spectacle and the bright lights and the excitement and I have a drink. You can do the same thing. It just seems to be a different kind of entertainment. I love to read how terrible people act, how we're killing each other, how we're destroying the planet. Who are you going to bet on? You're going to bet that man is going to burn down Brazil or would you like to bet
Or would you like to bet, would you like to even consider the odds that hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions will, that lie off this planet will continue to try to have them and it's just a matter of time before we just finally put our foot down and say, look, that's enough. <laughs> <clears throat> the bedding windows are now open. <laughs> Get in fast, the race will be starting shortly. After which time, no more bets shall be taken, <laughs> which is a difference between the ordinary and the revolutionist. Good night.